Good afternoon, and welcome to our event, Back to the Future, How Not to Write a Regulation. I'm Mark Jamison, a non-resident senior fellow with AEI. In July of last year, the Federal Trade Commission updated its rulemaking procedures. In a 3-2 party line vote, the FTC made itself more like a legislature than like a commission. Many progressives cheered, but the Republican minority at the commission was deep, deeply critical, as were many others. Created over 100 years ago, the FTC is set up as a bipartisan commission with a professional staff and with requirements for transparent rulemaking procedures. We set up commissions this way to limit how political ideologies and day-to-day -day political pressures impact their decisions. The FTC's recent actions undo some of these limits on political opportunism. Here to discuss this are AEI scholars J. Howard Beals III and Timothy J. Morris, who recently wrote a paper on the FTC's July decision, and former FTC Commissioner Maureen K. Olhausen, who's no stranger to AEI. Dr. Bills is Emeritus Professor of Strategic Management and Public Policy at George Washington University School of Business and a visiting senior fellow at AEI. He was director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection at the FTC from 2001 to 2004. He was associate director for policy and evaluation in the Bureau of Consumer Protection from 1983 to 87. And he was assistant and assistant to the director from 81 to 83 and a staff economist from 77 to 81. Professor Miras is a George Mason University Fo uh, Foundation professor of law at the Antonin Scalia Law School, senior, senior counsel at Sibley Austin, and a visiting senior fellow at AEI. He was chairman of the FTC from 2001 to 2004, and he was director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection from 81 to 83, and of the Bureau of Competition from 83 to 85, and an assistant to the director of the Office of Policy, Planning, and Evaluation from 1974 to 1976. Ms. Olhausen, is with Baker Botts and chairs its global antitrust and competition practice. She was a commissioner at the FTC from 2012 to 2018, serving as its chair during her last year. Prior to being a commissioner, she was a partner at Wilkinson Bauer, or Barker, now, now, excuse me, I, I mispronounce a lot of things. Um, prior to that, she served as director of the FTC's Office of Policy and Planning in 2004 to 2008, and earlier as deputy director of that office. Prior to that, she served as a commissioner advisor and in the FTC's general counsel's office. She also clerked in the U.S. Department of Appe excuse me, Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. So Howard, Tim, and Maureen, welcome. Tim, let's begin with you. The topic of agency rulemakings can sound very unexciting, especially with so many voters worried about inflation, crime, war, and the list can go on and on. What's the issue here? And help us understand why it matters. Sure. Uh, and uh, I, I want to welcome everybody. And it's, it's great to be uh, at a public event uh, and, you know, with my old friends Howard and, and uh, uh, Maureen. Let me, let, me, let me just start on a, on a personal note. I, I came to the FTC over... 45 years ago before I think most of, well, almost all of you were born. Uh, and one of the first things I worked on uh, uh, was something called the FTC food rule. Uh, I was in an office that was supposed to evaluate things. And uh, I, I was working for a professor of mine from UCLA and uh, a, a good friend of mine who was later my boss as dean of the law school where I teach, Mark Grady. Was, was heading up this particular project. He graduated a year ahead of me, so he was, he was already there when I arrived. And we decided that we were going to see if under this proposed food rule that you could say that oranges had more vitamin C than apples, which is true and obvious. Uh, and it turned out under the arcane procedures uh, that the staff had written uh, uh, to protect the public, you couldn't. Uh, and of course, uh, we couldn't resist, Mark, who wrote this sentence, couldn't resist saying that, I guess it's true after all, it, it's, it is hard to compare apples to oranges. So, uh, 
And that was a that was a good a good introduction, and it went downhill from there. And we're gonna <laughs> we're, we're gonna talk more about the history uh, the history as we go on because it's it's highly relevant. But the point is that the FTC, in which Howard and I have both had four four jobs, uh, you know, going back decades, uh, the FTC is a generalist agency. It's charged with prohibiting uh, unfair methods of competition and unfair or deceptive acts or practices over very wide parts uh, uh, of the economy. The commission has, has we uh, envisioned it and uh, as happened in the last 40 years up to the, the, the new leadership, saw itself mostly as enforcing uh, principles, rules of the road, uh, as a cop, uh, and, and they're so basic that people don't even think of them as rules. They're rules like you ought to, you know, you, no fraud. You ought to enforce your, uh, you ought to enforce your contracts. It's surprising the number of people, even legitimate companies, who occasionally try to rewrite their contracts unilaterally. Uh, they're rules about, you know, truth and advertising. Now. The new FTC, as we're going to discuss, the new leadership uh, has, a, has a different view, uh, uh, and that is the FTC ought to write actual prescriptive industry-wide transformative rules. These are, these are things that would change, uh, and again, we'll talk about the specifics as we go along here, but would change the way an industry works because they're fundamentally hostile, as were their activist predecessors in that time when I walked in decades ago, Howard and I came in decades ago, hostile to the current market. The view that I talked about, about enforcing these basic principles, is a view that markets work well, but markets need, you know, they need cops, they need enforcers, they need somebody to police these rules. Uh, uh, they don't need new transformative rules. And a problem with the FTC as a source of these transformative rules is FTC is not a specialist agency. It doesn't know, it, its strength is understanding uh, how to, how to uh, look at advertising and see whether it, it, it meets its basic standards. One of which, for example, is that if you make a performance claim, you need to have what's called uh, uh, substantiation. Uh, in hundreds, literally thousands of cases over 50 years now, they've developed standards for what's adequate uh, uh, substantiation. It's not an agency that knows a lot about particular industries. And if you want to transform an industry, you ought to know a lot about the industry. And so to do that, they, they need to start from scratch. Uh, and we'll see that is a hard process, and when they tried it before, uh, they failed, and they almost crushed the agency uh, uh, in the process. But it's about a vision of the FTC, and it's about if you're going to do these transformative rules, how you should do them, and the procedures that they adopted were procedures that will make it worse, uh, not, not better. Right, thank you. So, Howard, Tim was talking about the new leadership at the FTC, things they've been doing. Uh, what specifically did the FTC change last year regarding procedures for rulemakings, and why is it a concern? Well, they made a variety of changes, um, the thrust of which is less public input in the rulemaking process and more political control of the rulemaking process. And the only justification they offered is we need to do this quickly. We need to be faster. Uh, not a word about writing better rules or building better records or making better decisions, all about how fast can we get this done. Uh, one of the changes they made uh, is to uh, require less explanation of what they're up to. Uh, the old rules required, as does the statute, that the commission explain the reasons for a proposed rule with particularity. Um, uh, now, it turned out that didn't work very well in the 1970s. The commission didn't offer uh, sufficient explanation of what it was up to. Uh, and nearly every review of the 1970s rulemaking efforts concluded the commission needed to be clearer about what its theories were and about what the evidence was supporting uh, uh, its proposals, uh, and it didn't do that. Um, in the 1980 Improvements Act, Congress wanted to add more things to this list of things that had to be done with particularity. 
And so they added two more things to the list, the text of the rule and any alternatives. Uh, the commission now reads that as repealing the requirement uh, that they explain the reasons with particularity. They just have to say the reasons generally uh, under the new rules, not with particularity. But explanation of what's going on is the key to effective public participation, so less public participation. Second thing they did uh, was to effectively gut the role of the presiding officer who oversees the hearings and uh, uh, the, the preparation, if you will, of the rulemaking record. Um, by 1980, there was a consensus in the Mike Perchuk Commission uh, that the, the commission should rely more on presiding officers because the staff who worked on a, year, on a rule for years often developed a will to win uh, and a commitment to the rule whether the record supported it or not, quite frankly. Um, Congress codified that role of a presiding officer by requiring that the presiding officer be independent, uh, appointing by a chief presiding officer who reports to no other official of the commission. Uh, the rule change makes the chair the chief presiding officer. So the chair can appoint anybody they want. Um, not much independence there. Uh, a lot of room for, uh, for political control. Uh, Congress also required that the presiding officer make a recommended decision that takes into account <coughs> all relevant evidence on the rulemaking record. The new rules say, nah, that's too much. We only want the presiding officer to answer the questions that we, the commission, pose to the presiding officer and not say anything about anything else. How they can square that with the statute, I don't know. As I said, all they said was, well, this will be quicker. They didn't say anything about whether it made uh, any sense. The third change I'd like to highlight just briefly is rulemakings always ended with a final staff report that was a summary of the rulemaking record, a pretty comprehensive summary of the rulemaking record. And even when you disagreed with the staff report, which I did with some frequency, um, you could see what was in the, re in the record and what evidence was there uh, and know where to go looking to see whether the evidence supported what they were doing or not. Uh, and the staff made final recommendations as to what the rule should look like, often very different from what had been the original proposal. Uh, presiding officers relied on the staff reports. Reviewing courts relied on the staff reports. This commission abolished staff reports. Nobody needs to know what staff's recommending. Uh, also with staff reports, there was a round of, another round of public comment on the staff's final recommendations uh, before the commission made its decision about the rule. That's gone too. So again, less public input, more political control of the rulemaking process. Okay, thanks. Um, boy, just listening to you talk about it reminded me of one of, of Mark Zuckerberg's early mantra within Facebook, move fast and break things. Probably not a real good thing for a regulatory agency. I uh, worked for Facebook at least for a while. But in my, my day job at the University of Florida, we uh, teach a lot of countries about regulation. And we always talk about how do you justify your decisions to build legitimacy. And it's, it's always, here are the questions before us, here's the law, here's the evidence, and it all leads right to this, this decision. Important elements. So Maureen, um, you were recently a commissioner at the FTC, and, and now you work with clients. Um, I won't ask you to divulge any kind of confidential discussions you're having, but What's your sense for how this particular issue or these issues affect businesses, and how they contribute to the economy and the jobs they create? I think it's creating a lot of uncertainty because we have a lot of messages being sent from the FTC. They're going to engage in this broad rulemaking, whether it's on non-competes or it's on privacy or surveillance advertising. And these are all areas in which we already have existing laws. So uh, non-competes are generally done at the state level, right? And there's no certainty here about, well, will it be at a certain um, you know, salary, or is it going to be an unfair method of competition, it's going to, or is it going to be an unfair or deceptive act or practice? Um, then the privacy um, possible privacy rulemaking, I think, is creating really a lot of uncertainty because, for example, the, the head of the Bureau of Consumer Protection at the FTC recently gave a speech talking about how they're going to use unfairness to um, 
be their guide for privacy. So the FTC, and you know, a lot of credit to Howard and Tim for this, you know, has used unfairness carefully, um, but generally there is this requirement that um, there be a substantial harm. You know, it's, this is all statutory. Now, the way they're talking about unfairness, and, and the FTC has used unfairness in some privacy cases, goes far beyond those kinds of definitions and those kinds of limits, and far beyond what Congress has been considering when it's looking at privacy. So I've been heavily involved in the discussions in Congress about what a federal privacy bill might look like. So I, and there's also this uncertainty, will it be an unfair method of competition? Will it be an unfair deceptive act or practice? So it's just creating, I think, a lot of uncertainty about business planning going forward. Will common business models now be outlawed? Will, um, there's this moving away from the idea of notice and consent. You tell people how their data will be used, they agree to it, um, and then the FTC sues you if you don't, if you don't adhere to that promise. Uh, this approach and this focus on unfairness is saying, well, because of dark patterns or because of complexity, no one can really consent, so they're going to have perhaps a law that has strict data minimization in it, could really upend you know, very broadly, a lot of different business models across the economy. And so I think it's just creating a great uncertainty for not just existing businesses, which is problematic enough, but also for future uses of consumer information or new technologies, because we, you know, things don't just spring out, you know, full blown. There's a lot of research going on, development going on that takes several years in advance before a new product, new service comes to the market. So I think there, the FTC's rhetoric is creating that sort of like, well, is Congress going to move first? They're looking at a very different result uh, than, uh, or different approach than the FTC. And if they both move, you know, where do we end up in the middle and how do we <coughs> not get, you know, sort of the worst of both, of both worlds? So I'll ask you to come back later on, on that issue of the uncertainty. We, we know that capital rushes away from uncertainty, doesn't, doesn't lie risk very much at all. Um, the FTC in their statements at the time back in July said, oh, we're creating this great environment. We'll want to talk about that some more. And I, I should, should tell the audience I did not up front. We'll have questions from the audience in about 30 minutes. So if you have questions, please be sure to make notes of those and, and we'll get to them. Um, so but back to you, Howard. In your paper with Tim and in your Wall Street Journal op-ed, that you entitled The Return of the National Nanny. Um, they explained that we've been this way before, and both you and Tim have alluded to that. You specifically referenced back to experiences with the FTC back in the late 1970s. Elaborate on what happened then, please. Well, even before the FTC got uh, uh, rulemaking authority confirmed by Congress, uh, it was seeking to explore the limits of unfairness um, there was a Supreme Court decision that they thought was quite favorable to expansive reading of unfairness, and they established a special office to think about creative ways to use unfairness. Uh, it spawned a running joke among the staff that lasted at least 30 years about the unfair distribution of wealth rule, uh, which may yet be, be back with us. Um, then once they got rulemaking authority in 1974, they, lost a, they launched a rulemaking binge uh, in the period of a year, they made 16 rulemaking proposals, uh, most of which were transformative uh, across a broad range of industries affecting most aspects of everyday life, uh, from antacids to used cars to vocational schools. Uh, all of these would have been subject to transformative rules uh, that were pretty poorly thought out uh, and pretty poorly supported uh, by the evidence that the commission had available uh, uh, at the time. Uh, all of those rulemaking proposals provoked reactions uh, that were bubbling on Capitol Hill. Um, and then came children's advertising. Uh, in 1978, the commission proposed to ban uh, or was launched a rulemaking, uh, one outcome of which could have been to ban all advertising uh, directed to, uh, to children. Uh, the Washington Post published an editorial uh, entitled The National Nanny that essentially ridiculed this proposal 
uh, as something that wasn't entirely wasn't appropriate for uh, for the government to be worrying about at all. It was the responsibility of the nanny and not of the government. <laughs> and it, it was the the <clears throat> culmination uh, of a revolt on Capitol Hill. Uh, that revolt included not just Republicans but a lot of urban and northern Democrats. Um, uh, on the floor of the House, a House-backed leadership proposal, a uh, House leadership-backed proposal to reauthorize the agency failed um, uh, at, at one point because there weren't enough restrictions in the bill on what the, uh, what the agency could do. Um, uh, without authorization, the Appropriations Committee was unwilling to provide money for the FTC, uh, and at one point it shut down. Uh, I went to work. The only thing I could do was pack my boxes, um, prepare for orderly termination of activities was the, was the phrase. Uh, it didn't last very long, but it was the first time that Congress ever shut down an agency by not funding it over a policy dispute. Uh, so the reaction was strong, uh, substantial. Uh, the FTC was at very real risk. Uh, and if it goes that same way again, uh, it's likely to be at, at real risk again. He said, so Tim, um, Howard was talking about some of the reactions to what the FTC was doing back in the 70s. Um, can you elaborate on that any, and especially draw any parallels with today in terms of, of what the FTC is doing? Well, the parallels, the parallels are strong, uh, and the reactions are, are important. Uh, one reaction was in the, in the academy. Uh, Congress asked the Administrative Conference of the United States uh, uh, to do a study. It did, it did a, a scathing study of the inadequacy of the preparation for the rules. Uh, they were, they were not well thought out. Uh, the one Howard was the young staff economist working on the children's advertising proposal. And one of the main proposals of the staff was to ban advertising that uh, uh, programs uh, couldn't advertise to young, to young children. Well, it turned out, uh, work of Howard and some others, that the only program that would have been affected was Captain Kangaroo. Now, those of you probably have no idea who that is. Uh, the captain was the, uh, in my generation, Howard's in my generation, was the adult friend of millions of children before Mr. Rogers entered the neighborhood. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe the captain would have been sacrificed. But it, it turned out that, that most of what kids saw in terms of advertising was when they, you know, they watched Laverne and Shirley and Happy Days, or they came home from school and watched I Love Lucy. That's where they saw advertising. It wasn't on the Saturday morning cartoons. Most of the advertising was on these, was on these other shows. Uh, there were academic studies. Uh, 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 Professor Ellis from the University of Iowa, Teresa Schwartz, later in the, in the uh, Clinton administration deputy director, uh, did a study. Howard and I did a, did a study published by AEI a uh, long, long time ago, uh, called Rules Without Reason. Uh, and these studies were all scathing uh, in, in saying that if you're going to do rules, you ought to at least have some idea of what you were, of what you were doing. One of, the, one of the most interesting things was the staff decided that it didn't have to pay any attention to the remedy, because the remedy was not an issue for evidence. The remedy was an issue for the quasi-legislative discretion of the commission. So there was not an effort to develop evidence and tie the, the problems that they thought justified a rule to the remedy uh, uh, that, was, that was proposed. So what does that have to do with today? Well, part of what that has to do with today is that when I talk to the people who are running the FTC now, I can close my eyes and be in 1975. <laughs> the same kind of enthusiasm, the same attitudes. The, the people in 1975 were acolytes of Ralph Nader. They're now acolytes of Elizabeth Warren. Uh, you can decide, uh, those of you who know about Ralph Nader, uh, who's, who's in, uh, uh, not... Uh, uh, thought of in the terms now that he was then, but he was every bit as lauded uh, uh, 
by consumer advocates as, as Senator Warren is now, probably more so uh, because of the concentrated nature of the media. Uh, he, became, he became famous uh, because the auto industry uh, stupidly tried, tried to go after him. Uh, and the guy uh, you know, lived this uh, uh, priest-like, Gandhi-like uh, personal lifestyle. <laughs> so there was, there was nothing to find. Uh, uh, I actually, when I came to the FTC, I actually thought a lot of Ralph Nader. Uh, but then uh, uh, when the, there was a canning lid shortage, he testified in front of Congress, one of the ones who appeared to believe that there were trucks of canning, lo- canning lids somehow out there and warehouses full that were, that were being held uh, and they would come onto the market uh, you know, when the price went high enough. Uh, and I realized that this was a that this was a pattern of of uh, Mr. Nader's of of searching for uh, issues. Uh, but t- today's neo Brandesians uh, are are have another important characteristic that I frequently talk about in my in in my speeches. When we took over uh, in 1981 in the Reagan administration. We shifted the agency from rules to cases. They want to shift back from cases to rules. We wanted to do fraud cases. Howard and I couldn't have done a fraud case with a gun to our heads. Okay, so what did we do? We went out and hired, they happened to be women. I mean, part of the problem I had was I, I looked 19, I was 31, 32, looked 19, and, and, and uh, I found lots of men didn't want to look for didn't want to work for a kid who looked like he was 19, and, and women were, were more tolerant. Uh, it's a long, uh, and plus I had plenty of testosterone for the, you know, for the whole room. Uh, <laughs> it, it's true. Uh, and and uh, the, so these people that we hired, and we found a lot of people on the staff who, who did fraud cases. They wanted to litigate. They were experienced. They knew how to do courtrooms. Uh, the people who run the FTC today could walk into any major DC <clears throat> law firm and find good Democrats at, at the right age, you know, late 30s into their 40s, who want to go into government, would love to work in the Biden administration, know how to do rulemaking, but they won't touch them because if you work for a big law firm, you're tainted because you've represented those big bad companies. Uh, I, you know, I find that. Interesting, uh, but uh, uh, it's it's a fact of of uh, the world in which in which they live, which has handicapped their ability to to implement implement their agenda. But they do share the vision of the nineteen of, of, of the nineteen seventies. And another big difference, however, is the agency they took over in the mid nineteen seventies was an agency where they had already cleaned out the career staff. Casper Weinberger came in in 1970 as chairman. Uh, And the FTC pre-1970 was in disrepute. There were a a Ralph Nader study that uh, one of the chapters was was called Bright Men, it was all men in those days, need not apply. Uh, and they showed, uh, uh, the study showed that people from the Ivy Leagues, uh, w- w- which were thought in even higher repute than, than, than they are now, uh, were not hired. Uh, they showed that uh, certain congressmen you know, fed people into the agency. They claimed to find people asleep on their couches. Uh, and then there was a follow-up uh, prestigious report from the American Bar Association that that in, in, in much less uh, inflammatory terms, basically said that the FTC had to change. So they were starting over with a new staff. Today, they have inherited a, a very good professional staff, many people who've been there for decades. Uh, and they've made the mistake of, of castigating that staff and turning on them. And a recent OPM study showed that the FTC has gone from uh, a very happy, contented professional staff to a very unhappy uh, uh, professional staff. Uh, so that's a significant difference. You know, what I'm saying is they have many of the same characteristics and goals, uh, but they are uh, stumbling at least out the gate in, uh, uh, in implementing the strategy. 
So, Maureen, let me tap into your experience, recent experience, being at the commission and, and how this, if, if under these particular procedures and rules, how this would have affected your job. So, when you were at the FTC, it was as it had developed over a few decades, and it was case-oriented, as I understand it. I've never worked there, as, as Tim and Howard describe it. Um, how do you think working in this environment would be different and what do you think the differences in outcomes would be? Well, one of the most formative experiences I had during my time at the commission was when I was the acting chairman for the first essentially 18 months of the Trump administration. So it was just myself and my Democratic colleague, Carol McSweeney. And one would have thought that that would be a recipe for gridlock and conflict and you know, all sorts of you know, inability to get anything done. But because the FTC, first of all, had such a wonderful career staff who will do what the leadership wants them to do uh, and do it very well and be very supportive, uh, particularly when you appreciate them and give them good tasks to do. Um, and the bipartisan nature of these principles of antitrust enforcement focused on consumer welfare, consumer protection enforcement focused a lot on deception, fraud. We did a lot of privacy uh, enforcement. We did data breach. A lot of um, key cases that we were able to bring and she and I supported. It wasn't a time of gridlock. It wasn't a time of not getting things done. We actually kept up the same level of enforcement that the previous administration had kept up. Um, so, and I think there, that speaks to predictability. It speaks to the ability to reach common ground. Um, it's when you come in and you say, which current leadership has done, everyone who came before me was feckless, was foolish, was you know, off base, you know, across the board, they are as, vitriolic to the Obama officials as they would be to the Trump officials, and just basically said, oh, and staff has been you know, such a disaster. What are you going to get to? These are your resources, right? The FTC is a small agency. It has limited budget. It's been able to punch way above its weight. And I think it is because it really had these clear principles, had a motivated staff, and it had a basis for common ground. Not that we agreed on everything, and a commission is not meant to agree on everything. But I, I do think that moving away from those principles and very aggressively moving away from them and explicitly moving away from them is actually creating a situation where they're trying to do a lot through rulemaking, but, and they're trying to do a lot through changing guidelines and policy statements because they are, don't have either the interest or the expertise or the capability to do the kind of case-by-case -case enforcement, which is really <coughs> how you cement progress in both areas of the FTC's area of ex expertise. So the, the rulemaking, now the FTC you know, has done some rulemaking and they're supportive, but it is areas where they have in the consumer protection already established through a lot of successful litigation that this is a violation, that this is the kind of thing basically courts agree and FTC commissioners agree has long been a violation. So there's this requirement for prevalence, right? That, that there, you know, it's an unfair or deceptive act or practice um, and that it's prevalent and also the rules, and I think this is poorly understood, Rulemaking doesn't give the FTC any additional authority to go beyond what is an unfair deceptive act of practice, right? So what's already been defined through case law or through statute for, an unfair, for um, unfairness or through the FTC's own policy statement in um, deception should kind of be the meets and bounds of what a, an FTC rule in this area can do. But from the rhetoric that we've been seeing, it seems to be the vision that no, 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 through a rule, they can far exceed any of that. So I think that they're creating a situation where um, they, and I know it, it's obvious, they are moving away from enforcement, 
Commissioner Wilson has pointed out how the FTC's enforcement has kind of fallen off a cliff. They're putting all these resources to rulemaking. They're driving out good staff. And that's an enormous risk. They're creating an enormous risk for the FTC to have these very resource intensive activities that are ultimately going to fail. And we live in a world of constrained resources. There's an opportunity cost. They are not then bringing the cases where they could be moving law forward in a beneficial way, which I think the FTC has been able to do in a lot of really key areas over time. So I think, you know, the the, the time when I was acting chair, you know, didn't necessarily get a lot of coverage because, you know, two people get along in a bipartisan way and get a lot of things done just doesn't grab headlines the way, like, oh, let's, you know, go to the barricades and tell everyone else they're terrible and, you know, sort of change the world. But that, I was able to do that because of that clarity at the FTC, and I'm afraid that will be lost. Listening and, to and, and Maureen ahead, deserves so. enormous credit for that. And so does Terrell McSweeney, who was the other, the other commissioner. Yeah, we, we, you know, uh, we emerged from that, I think, better friends than we went into it, which, you know, you could imagine. Sure. And, and we had sharp, like something like the Qualcomm case, which was voted out, you know, post-election, right. right before, a sure, few days before. Sure, right before Edith yeah, left, right? Yeah, right. that I didn't support, that still went forward, and eventually the Ninth Circuit saw it my way, but... Um, you know, it's not that we were in agreement on everything. We weren't, but there were things that we said, well, we're, we're, we're going to agree to disagree on this, and then we moved on to the next, to the next thing. Well, the, look, the FTC's been in a world. Ronald Reagan famously said that in 80, somebody agrees with you 80% of the time is not a 20% enemy. <laughs> uh, and that's the way the FTC has been uh, in, the, in what the President of the United States stood up and said you have failed for the last 40 years to everybody involved in this enterprise. I mean, you know, and that was written, and he was flanked by his, the FTC chair and his competitions are. But, I mean, that's one hell of a message. One of the things I've learned from working across countries is that whenever you have the political instability, the political fighting, oftentimes it's the quality of, of the the permanent staff that carry you through those times. And so it's really problematic when, when you damage that part of your infrastructure. Let me ask a, a slightly different question. Um, Howard, you got your, you studied economics at the University of Chicago. Another of the um, University of Chicago graduates, um, Thomas Sowell, talked about, well, you have these people who seek to transform industries. He called them the anointed and the vision of the anointed, uh, they, they like to be able to design companies and businesses and markets. Um, if that's where the FTC and other parts of the administration might be going, how does this play out? Um, well, to, to, to try to do it through rulemaking, uh, they're going to run up against the reality, I think, that they really do need evidence. Um, uh, to establish uh, that, that the remedy will work. Their authority is to define with specificity uh, an unfair or deceptive act or practice, so they've got to sort of fit it uh, uh, in, into that window. Uh, the procedures that they adopted last July are surely subject to challenge uh, for, for some of the reasons that, uh, that I've outlined, and, and uh, as rulemaking starts to unfold, um, the, the, um, will, there will surely be uh, challenges uh, before the commission and eventually in court uh, to, uh, uh, to, those, uh, to those proceedings. Uh, that is the fate that some of the 70s rules made, uh, met. Uh, what's maybe the best example was the vocational schools rule, which was built around a reimagined business model of vocational schools. Let's give everybody a pro rata refund if they drop out early, and then schools will have the right incentives, and the world will fix itself. Um, uh, that collapsed. Uh, the commission actually adopted the rule, and it was rejected in the courts. Um, uh, and the uh, because it didn't have it, it, it couldn't identify specific unfair or deceptive acts or practices, 
uh, it just it just had a let's remake the world uh, idea, um, uh, and uh, you know I would I, I would think if the I, I would think if we come up with new remake the world kinds of ideas, uh, then then they're likely to meet a, a very similar fate. One of the things that's interesting about this is for all the talk about rulemaking, there are no proposed rules. <laughs> uh, that hasn't happened yet. Uh, it's just sort of watch this space um, uh, that you know sooner or later things will appear. Um, and I think we'll know a lot more about where they are really trying to go uh, as those proposals uh, start to emerge. Uh, but but um, uh, the... <coughs> The, the, the trying to reimagine the world um, uh, in your own image uh, is not the way effective rulemaking proceeds. So, Tim, one more question before I, I turn things over to the audience. We've talked about um, people's reactions to what the FTC did back in the 70s, uh, possible and actual reactions today. Over the past few years, in discussions with the Neo Brandeisians, their preemptive strike has been, well, everybody who disagrees with us is just ideologues. Um, or, or they've been bought off by industry. How does the audience know what is just the ideological response, what is the bought off response, and what is the response that's good for public policy? That, 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 is, that is an excellent question. And look, it's very hard to judge uh, debate in Washington, uh, it look politics has always been has always been a rough sport. Uh, but uh, you know there are there are differences now, obviously. What, but but one thing I think that you should look at the neo Brandesians is look at their views of history and the things that they like, uh, and just. Go, go back, uh, they like transportation regulation. Uh, that's a rejection. I met, I met Steve, Stephen Breyer in 1975 when he was convincing Ted Kennedy to deregulate the airline industry. The president's executive order, the one where he made the, the 40 years, uh, that, that calls to begin re-regulating railroads. Uh, they love Brandeis. They miss the part of Brand. Brandeis was hostile to all bigness, including government. They miss that part of Brandeis. Uh, in 1936, FDR, after the failure of the uh, of, 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 after the Supreme Court bailed him out of the the failure of the Blue Eagle and the and the NRA. Uh, uh, FDR, against the advice of some of his cabinet, went after the economic royalists and, and castigated them. Uh, that's a, you know, Brandeisian idea. Uh, well, if Brandeis had had his way, Roosevelt, four years later, wouldn't have been able to praise the arsenal of democracy. Uh, and if it wouldn't have been for the arsenal of democracy, we might be uh, conducting this conference on whatever the topic was in German. Uh, they, the Neo-Brandesians, praise, uh, they praise something called the Robinson-Patman Act, which was passed in 1936. And the Robinson-Patman Act was an effort to handicap chain stores. Their enemy was the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, uh, uh, which no longer exists. Uh, if the only thing that left is, is 8 o'clock coffee, if anyone has heard of that. That's a creation of... Of the of the A and P, the A and P was such a big deal in America that the young John Updike, fresh off of uh, of of explaining that gods don't answer letters, the god being Ted Williams hitting home run in his last at bat, uh, wrote a short story that people in my generation had to read uh, in high school. Also published in the New Yorker, and he was looking for a symbol of mid-century culture to set the story. And he put it at the A&P, and he called the story the A&P. Uh, it was the largest retail in the United States for 40 years. Uh, and it's now gone. Uh, it's a symbol of the, of, of the importance of, of the, the dynamic uh, nature of, of capitalism. But this law was passed to cripple it. It took antitrust decades to uh, 
in, interpret the law in a way that was consistent with the rest of antitrust law. And Lena Khan comes along and says, I love that law. I, you know, I want to go back to the old uh, uh, interpretations. Uh, big and bad in general has returned with a vengeance. You can see all this in the attacks on, on big tech. A lot of this will show up uh, in, in, in rules. I mean, they haven't said much, as Howard is saying. Uh, there are multiple aspects of privacy that they're talking about, including security, dark patterns, privacy rules. Uh, you know, can you imagine trying to draft privacy rules that apply to everyone and everything? Well, that's what, that's what rules do. That's what we're talking about. Uh, these aspects of, of, of retail marketing uh, are particular uh, uh, hobby horse of the, F, of the FTC's chair. Uh, if, if these laws that are kicking their way through Congress don't pass, uh, uh, then the FTC may try to put some of that into, uh, uh, into rules. And one thing different uh, that Maureen has written on, and Howard and I have a foreword in a book where Maureen has a couple of chapters <laughs> coming out. It, it's coming out on the day I, they, they asked me to participate. It happens to be my 25th wedding anniversary, yeah. so I... Today's my 37th wedding anniversary. Oh, well, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> but I'm here without my husband. <laughs> well, I, 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 was, uh, I am not going to be back in D.C. No. on the 25th wedding That's anniversary. Spe- 25 is a special one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, that book talks a lot about one thing different from this group of activists in the 70s group, which is trying to use unfair methods of competition rulemaking. Some of the rules in the, in the 70s used this Section 18 statute we talked about to do competition rulemaking uh, because there is no bright line between uh, unfair methods and, and unfair acts or practices. There clearly must be things that you can only do with one or the other, or there wouldn't be two, two separate ones, but you know there are, there are overlaps. Uh, but we, we are in for uh, uh, a serious period of why we started the, the, the report with this famous quote allegedly made by Mark Twain that history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And I think we're in for some serious rhyming. All right. So now let me open the floor to the audience. If you have questions, we have people with microphones. Please just raise your hand. And we have people online, I guess, that can ask questions, too. Right? Uh, if you're online, you can as well. Here's one right up here. I have a question. Yep. Microphone on its way. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> thank you for being here. Thank you for doing this. And I just, uh, what, uh, uh, so great to see you up here, Tim, because I'm so, I cherish the fact that you're here at AEI. It really means a lot to me. Thank it's you, great Chris. to see you. Thanks for having me be here. Um, <clears throat> thank you for your service. Thank you for your willingness to do that. That's an awful th- <laughs> at an awful time in American political history. Uh, you did a good and noble thing. Thank you. Uh, and I think we should be nicer to public servants because the, some of them that are not awful, we should be really nice to because it's awful. <laughs> it's a terrible <laughs> job. Um, here's my concern. Where are the yous who are 30 years old now? Where, are the, where is the pro-testosterone 31 or whatever, whatever the hormonal balance of any of the individuals may be that are fired up and want to go do this stuff because the answer to the previous of the rhyming history is you. And I know this is an impossible question to ask. What can I do? What can AEI do to encourage the next generation of young people who want to come and do this? Because conservatives very often denigrate public service to the point that they don't even they won't even do it, <laughs> and we need to do better. So, uh, any suggestions about what we can do? I would love to hear. Well, that's a that's another damn good question. Look, when I uh, when I was seventeen, I decided I didn't know it, it was called public policy, but I decided to do public policy. Uh, and believe me, that's aberrant <laughs> to decide anything that you want to do your life's work at seventeen. But that's what I did, and I went to law school because I figured that was a good you know, a good way to do it. Uh, and, you know, I came from a working class background. I had no clue of, of, of any of this or, or, you know, or, or anything else. Uh, 
I have an eight-year-old grandson who's the first eight-year-old I've encountered in a long time who has the same interests that I had as an eight-year-old. Uh, which, so, so it's genetic. Uh, I, I, I don't. I, it's it's weird. It's, it's weird. He he calls me up repeatedly to ask me arcane history questions. So it's weird. But I I I really wonder. Uh, what I look, he doesn't know this, but when he's 14 or 15, he's going down in my basement with me to help where all my papers are and stuff, and we're going to scan them. And, and, and I've been in a lot of interesting places, and I'm not important enough to write a real autobiography, but, but I, you know, I was in, in Tallahassee in, 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 in 2000. I've been in, you know, I've been in a lot of campaigns. You know, Jim, Jim Baker's uh, spent. When the stock market crashed, I, I went 60 days with, with seeing Jim Baker all the time and not my, and not my family. Uh, so I've been a lot of interesting places. Uh, and, and, he, and he's going to help me, you know. He doesn't know this yet, but he's going to help me sort <laughs> He's going to help me sort all this. Uh, but do I want him uh, to try to do that life, or is it better? You know, my two kids are scattered. They're not interested. You know, one's in Johnson City, Tennessee. The other's in Charlotte, North Carolina. They're away from this world. And there's a lot about this world that's, that's, that's difficult. Uh, and, uh, you know, a AEI, AEI nurtures it. Uh, and I still think uh, there are places for uh, people who want to do public policy. Uh, uh, and there, you know, th there's a whole structure that didn't exist when I was younger. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I still think you can do it. I, I don't think the whole world is woke. Uh, in fact, the backlash is, is, is promising. Uh, I do think, you know, one, one has to be careful. But, but that's, you know, that's always been true. Uh, and I, you know, having spent a lot of time around Reagan, I, I, in 1966, uh, in high school, I walked to, to the Saturday before Reagan got elected. I walked to watch a speech of his uh, in uh, uh, 1972 in the summer. I spent a lot of time watching him give press conferences and stuff in, in Sacramento. And he was a fundamentally optimistic guy about America and its future. And I've always been a glass half full guy. And I think that's, that's you know, that's, that's really important. Uh, and the kind of institution that this is, it was very important to me in the late 70s uh, because we did our planning for the FTC here. I met Nino Scalia here. Nino, I was the first person in Bush 43 that Nino swore in. He was an old friend. Even We argued a lot about Nino. Uh, the young guys on the court, like Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, helped convert him. He was too standoffish toward regulatory agencies in, in, his, uh, in, in his earlier days. He liked Chevron and things like that. Uh, he was changing in, 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 as he got older. Uh, but I, I do think that institutions like this are, are extremely important. And, you know, nurturing young people uh, is great. And there are a lot of young people here, and I, and I like that. And it's one of the things that Maureen was particularly good at as in, in her role. She always had a lot of good young people around her. Yeah, no, I've, I've been really fortunate uh, to have people. And, and one interesting thing that I found is that often... They'd come in and they might work for me as an intern or something, and and you know they often had this very expansive view of like, well, government, we wanted to do all these things, and these processes get in the way, and it's a, you know, and and you know, trying to say like, well, look, it, this isn't about efficiency. This is about preserving liberty. This is about you know your ability or other people's ability. And one of the things that I focused on when I was chair. And actually, surprisingly, ended up in the Biden's executive order on competition. Yeah, it was great. Is occupational licensing, right? Yeah. And that's something that I think. Tell them your name for how you did it. Oh, I, I did an economic liberty task force, <laughs> and really focused on that issue. And it was a bi it ended up being kind of a bipartisan issue, but I think once it kind of opens their eyes that government processes can be used in a way that is keeps other people out of the market, particularly people on the, lo the lowest end of the economic ladder, and that it is not all about, um, you know, oh, isn't this great? We're going to, it's like, well, these, these are enormous powers. They have to be used carefully. Or, like, there's a lot of impatience with the separation of powers in our Constitution these days. 
You say, well, that is really key to preserving liberty. And you see that in the FTC, right? This whole idea that they want to take on these legislative powers. They want to be efficient. They want to do all these things with no respect for those other things. So I think kind of finding one of those issues and occupational licensing tended to be one that like average people could say, yeah, that doesn't make sense that you need, you know, 500 hours of training to braid hair, right? Or you can't have a, um, uh, a criminal conviction and be a landscaper in some places. I think that starts to open people's eyes to why we need to be very, what does government serve and what are these um, sort of institutions and restrictions that are in place to try to make sure it doesn't really be turned towards negative and I, I think one of the things that institutions like AEI can do that's really important is build the record. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I studied regulation and its effects. Uh, and it was really clear there were a lot of bad effects um, because the evidence was there. I mean, the evidence had been, the evidentiary base had been built um, by, by people who went before me. Uh, and I had academic opportunities, but I said, God, this FTC is doing a lot of crazy things and it's, you know, they need somebody to tell them these are crazy things. Uh, so I'll go give that a try. And sometimes it worked, <laughs> but not yeah. always. <laughs> M M Milton Friedman always said when the, you know, the reason you do this work is when the crisis comes, and they always come, th this is the kind of place that, you know, the policy people turn, the, you know, the government leaders turn to. I, I do want to note about occupational licensure, though. It's, it, 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 what, what Maureen was trying to do at the FTC was great, and it's really important. The executive order version of it is occupational licensure unless it raises wages. Now, wait a minute. That's why people want <laughs> occupational licensure. It raises wages. It raises wages for the people already inside the club, right? And right. by keeping out the others who, you know, like in Louisiana, you need a license to be a florist. And guess who... Um, administers the exam, all the other florists, right? So they don't have a lot of incentive to let new people in. But, but they're classic barriers to entry, but it's just a, it's, a very, um, it's a very schizophrenic attitude in the executive order. It's competition, but n not, not always. <laughs> Another question. Um, let's go up here, and then we'll go back here, and that'll wrap us up then. Yeah, we're owning it right now, you guys. Um, just the separation of powers. Um, recently, there was a Fifth Circuit decision directed at the SEC about how the internal workings there had created some perhaps problems with the separation between judiciary and the executive. And I wondered if anyone had any thoughts about what the implications could be for the FTC and its internal systems. It, it definitely could have implications for, for the FTC. Um, I think there is you know, certainly they interpreted very broadly in that, um, in that decision what is a legislative power, right? And so the, the idea between choosing to go administratively or into federal court. Um, and if, boy, if that's how strict it's going to be, the idea that the FTC's rulemaking for this interpreting a very broad statute and one of the other interesting things is under Humphrey's executor, the FTC is held on because it does case by, you know, kind of says in there, it does case by case enforcement. And so it's not like these are, well, as it turns towards broader rulemaking, I think that also brings that into there, 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 sharp relief. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, there are a couple separate questions here, and I'm, I, I'm worried for the reason I'll come to shortly. Uh, the, there's the, the Humphrey's executor's question fine, overrule Humphrey's executor, that means the president can fire any, anyone. But the real question there is, it's the institutional question. Bill Clinton decided 30 years ago, almost 30 years ago, that the leader in the Senate of the other party could pick the minority commissioners. If, if that sticks, if the president sticks with that, then getting rid of Humphrey's executor doesn't mean squat for the FTC. That's the real issue. And, and, uh, and the problem is, okay, so then you take the structure of the FTC. 
There's nothing written in the sky that says if you have a unitary executive, you have to have a one-person agency. Uh, and what I'm worried about is if there's anything that should ever be unconstitutional because of all the crazy delegation to it and all the, the it's cut off from the budget and everything else, it's the CFPB. And all that the efforts to declare the CFPB unconstitutional got was it allowed the Democrats to fire the Bush head of the CFPB. I, you know, that boy. Uh, and now part of the problem was the courts, did they want to, did they want to go after that budgetary uh, uh, status, which clearly violates, I think, article, I, I, I teach budget. Uh, it clearly <clears throat> violates the Constitution. That means the Fed is unconstitutional. I don't see the courts going. Okay, uh, Jennifer, and then we'll wrap up. So I'm curious, you mentioned how in many ways the recent actions by the FTC resemble its past history as a more political agency, particularly leading up to that showdown in the 1970s. However, one kind of distinct feature this time is while in the 1970s we had Congress acting as this check, and in the post um, showdown of, of that we saw Magnuson Moss rulemaking come in, we saw various other policy statements to kind of rein in the FTC authority. Right now, though, we actually have people in Congress seeking to give the FTC more authority, particularly over antitrust, which seems to be a different kind of dynamic than we saw in the 70s. So I was wondering if you could speak to that, as well as we are seeing a lot of debates around data privacy and the FTC as the logical regulator there. What, if any, guardrails, given this kind of current politicization, for lack of a, a better term, and this current kind of growth of um, rulemaking that we've seen in the desire of the agency, would you suggest Congress consider putting around those? Well, so starting with your second question first, I would hope that if we have a federal privacy bill, it would be very detailed. And it would give the FTC very targeted rulemaking authority. Think about the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act that gave the FTC rulemaking authority. But Congress did a pretty good job, I think, of kind of laying out the parameters of what Congress really wanted. The issue is, all right, now you just take unfair deceptive acts or practices, you know, go and the Rorschach test or whatever you want, you, you want, you want to do with that. Uh, on the antitrust bills, what we're seeing, I think, is this thin end of the wedge idea that, well, it's only going to be targeted to an identifiable small number of tech companies, and all the amendments that we see, saw just come out made sure that others were all carved out of that, right? So my, one of my big concerns there is you do have some Republicans supporting that because of their anger with tech companies. But... With the FTC, with broad rulemaking authority, why wouldn't they say, this is the sense of Congress, and now we are going to propagate that throughout the whole economy? Because the public policy suggests this kind of behavior or self-preferencing or not giving access to your asset, you know, kind of going to Tim's point about reintroducing, you know, common carrier style rail or railroad regulation the FTC can just say, thank you very much. The Congress, you did that for tech. We're doing it for everybody else, right? And so I'm not sure that's been appreciated enough. And it totally undermines the position that we've taken around the world in antitrust law for years and years and years and years, that antitrust is about protecting consumers. It is not about protecting competitors. And I think we've really done damage to our ability there. And then these bills are very much focused on American companies. So it's kind of, you know, why wouldn't every other regime who wants to engage in some industrial policy say, oh, yeah, that's fine. We're, you know, you, the, those tech companies are bad. We're going we're gonna to smack them just like you're doing in, in the U.S. So I think it really hurts American competitiveness, too. Um, but... Um, I mean, I, 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 big concerns all around. I'm a little bit optimistic, I guess, because it was, uh, I mean, and, and again, um, children's advertising is instructive. Um, Mike Perchuk thought there was an unbeatable political coalition that was going to um, bring him to fame on the children's <clears throat> advertising rulemaking. 
didn't quite work out that way. Um, and I think uh, as the FTC starts to get concrete about some of the proposals that will inevitably um, gore some oxes, uh, that the, the, the political reaction to that is going to change. Whether it will change enough, I don't know. There clearly is right now uh, a lot of political support for at least the rhetoric of the FTC, if, if not its yet, as yet non-existent actions. Um, but it, it, it's going to matter what they actually do and what the reactions to that are. Yeah, the first sentence of our report is with the political winds at their backs, activists. And we're describing the 1970s because they had the political winds at their backs for a long time in the 70s. The world turned on them when they, when, when they massively overreached. And it, it, this is a world where things are more compressed. So I suspect uh, that that will turn. Now, there is a big difference. Uh, the, de the people who were the Washington representatives of companies in the 1970s were Democrats, as many of them are now. But they were Democrats uh, who had worked for moderate and conservative senators and congressmen. Now, they, a lot of them don't. And I, uh, a lot of what happened, my good friend Paul Chagot wrote an editorial about Walmart supporting healthcare. And he actually said in the editorial, next time you've got trouble, Walmart, don't come to these pages looking for help. That was pretty astonishing. Uh, and it's because a lot of the corporations uh, uh, thought that it would be better for them to cut deals uh, in the Obama administration. Uh, than it was to do what happened in the late 70s where the, where the corporations rose up. So I don't, I mean, that is a difference. Uh, but uh, you, when you're talking about the 70s, you're absolutely right about the late, the, the Carter administration, but not, not in the Nixon years. Okay, so let me close with the related or similar question uh, for each of you. At some point in the future, we have a Republican administration. Does it take advantage? of how things have rolled out here and move fast to do something, or does it build back the institutional practices? Which do you think happens? Um, start with you, Maureen. I think it depends on whether you have a very populist one, right? Because we certainly saw that in the Trump administration, right? Where, well, there were some conservative principles, but not really concerns about using government authority or ex excessive government authority to punish political enemies. So, uh, you know, it's a, very, it's a very confusing time to be Republican is <laughs> all, I, all I can say. So I, I really think it depends on the, the nature of the administration. Okay. Howard? Um, I, I don't think, um, I think a Republican administration is a lot more likely to be oriented towards case-by-case -case enforcement than, by rule, than towards rulemaking in general. And that means changing the procedures for rulemaking back to something that's more sensible um, is a much lower priority. Uh, and um, frankly, in every rulemaking since 1976, the commission hasn't actually followed the old rules as they were written. They've adopted special procedures, which the rules let them do, uh, to govern each individual rulemaking. So I think that would happen. I don't think, I don't think anyone will follow these rules in a Republican administration, but, but I'm not sure they'll rewrite them to go back. Uh, they'll adopt special procedures for whatever rules they want, and they'll mostly do cases. Yeah. And Tim? Yeah, look, I agree, uh, I agree with Howard on the procedures and Maureen on the substances open. <laughs> look, in the fall of 2000, the Obama and Clinton alums of the FTC and DOJ were thinking, ah, oh, we're coming back. Those are, as, more, as Maureen stated, those are persona non grata. Uh, it, it's, th there is not exactly a similar movement on, on the you know, conservative populist circles uh, uh, for Republicans to, to look to the way there were the neo-Brandesians. But if something you know, like that were to happen, uh, uh, then you know, who knows what Republican uh, you know, antitrust and consumer protection could look like. And I think that's what Maureen was, what, what was alluding to. I would think uh, whoever it is uh, would, 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 would do what Howard's talking about. But the substance, I mean, the variation on the substance could be significant. 
All right, well, Maureen, Howard, and, and Tim, thank you very much for your insights, and thank you, everyone, for being with us today. Uh, please watch for further papers and events from the American Enterprise Institute. Be sure to share your thoughts. Let us know what you would like for our scholars to look into. Thank you for being here.